So Marriage Prep 101, getting ready for the big day. Lesson 11, the blessings of marital fidelity. Uh, according to Rose uh, Lethem of Entrepreneur, Entrepreneur Magazine, here are the five professions or jobs that have the lowest and highest rate of divorce. I thought that would be interesting. To, which jobs have the highest and lowest rate of divorce? So we start with the lowest. The jobs that have the lowest rate of divorce. Actuary, 17%. <laughs> Actuary, those are, the, those are the men and women who figure out the odds for insurance, I guess. You know. <laughs> Actuaries, insurance, physical, physical scientists and medical scientists, 18 and 19 percent, divorce rate, low divorce rate. Ministers, come in number four, ministers and software developers, 20 percent, 20 percent divorce rate. <gasps> People say, ministers get divorced? You bet, they do, yes they do. Uh, physical therapists and optometrists. Uh, where's, uh, where's Corey when I need to make fun of him? Huh? Uh, physical therapists and optometrists, 21%. That's at the low end. At the high end, gaming managers in casinos, <laughs> you know, 53%. Bartenders, yeah, 52%. Flight attendants, General casino workers and factory workers, 50%. Telemarketers, 49%. Textile workers, 48%. Interesting, just thought you'd like to see those, those numbers. Speaking of divorce percentages, here are the five states that have the highest divorce rates according to the Wall Street, uh, um, Wall Street Journal. Lowest and highest. The lowest, Massachusetts, Hawaii, New Jersey, New York, Minnesota, all in the 12% range. Isn't that amazing? And then highest, Arkansas, Idaho, Nevada, Louisiana, and Oklahoma. And the highest uh, divorce rates by, by state. Uh, one reason for the low, I was curious you know, about why the low divorce rates in these states here and those other states, you know, Arkansas and uh, uh, Louisiana, Oklahoma, those are Bible, that's the Bible belt, you know. Uh, one reason for the low divorce rate in these five states is the fact that except for Hawaii, these four states have the highest number of Roman Catholics whose religion forbids divorce. You can't get divorced if you're a Catholic. Even where there is adultery or infidelity, the innocent party needs to obtain permission from the church to divorce while remaining in good standing as a faithful Catholic within the church. I mean, you know, I grew up Catholic in, in a Catholic province and that, that's for sure. I can, I can attest to this, absolutely. The difficult and lengthy process probably contributes to the low divorce rate in states with a high number, high percentage of Catholic uh, citizens. Um, one more statistic about divorce, and this is the same no matter which religions or non-religious group you survey. The number one cause of divorce, infidelity, cheating on your spouse. Interesting thing about cheating on your spouse is that it is, it is frowned upon by every group. You know, devoted Christians, frown upon infidelity. Atheists frown upon infidelity. Same-sex marriage frown upon infidelity. It doesn't matter what group you are, cheating is, you know, no matter how modern or whatever, you know, cheating is still in our society today. A lot of things, you know, the moral level is lower than it has been but cheating is still a no-no, no matter what group uh, you belong. So there are many things that lead or cause infidelity, lack of communication, selfishness, boredom. But when stating the actual reason for the final and legal breakup of the marriage, infidelity is the cause that is most mentioned, according to stats. Now, I don't want my lesson or my approach to this problem to be framed in negative terms. 
don't cheat, don't divorce, since this would simply be stating the obvious and repeating things that you already know. Instead of this usual approach, I thought that it'd be both more informative and more encouraging to review some of the wonderful blessings that naturally arise when partners in a marriage remain faithful to one another. Now, before I talk about the blessings, I'd like to say a word about fidelity or faithfulness itself so we can all be on the same page when we do move on to describing the rewards. Marital fidelity, the type of marital fidelity that I'm talking about uh, this morning has three basic components. First, complete fidelity. Complete fidelity. To bear the kind of fruit that I'm going to describe, the faithfulness in marriage must be complete. Your mind is faithful. Your body is faithful. Your words, your intentions are faithful. Fidelity is like a costly fragrant oil that is reserved only for your partner. No one else gets to experience it in any way whatsoever. In complete fidelity, no one but your partner receives your tenderest looks, thoughts, touches. No one gets any part of what your spouse receives. It's interesting that Valentine's Day uses the heart as its symbol for love because Jesus said that this is where everything begins, the good and the bad. In, verse, in Matthew 5, 8, he says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And then in 528, he says, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her, where? In his heart. In complete fidelity, a person tunes their heart to their spouse, almost like, you know, radio dial, you're finding the station. Well, you tune yourself to your spouse. And then you give and receive signals only from this person. There's no daydreaming about what love would be like with another person. I mean, talk about undermining your relationship. You know, daydreaming, boy, I wonder what it'd be like you know, with, with her or with him or with this person or that person. There's no sexual pleasure with anybody else. Whether it be a fictional character in a book, a picture, a movie that gives various sexual thrills, or that harmless flirting that often ends up destroying a family. Complete fidelity means that you are totally devoted to your spouse in mind and body. The second component of marital fidelity, lifetime fidelity. This is, there's a trick question on some premarital questionnaires that engaged couples fill out when they go for marriage counseling. It asks the following question. After you've tried everything to resolve your conflicts, what will you do, divorce or separate? And it's amazing how many pick one of these two options instead of the third option, which isn't given, and that is keep trying, because divorce isn't an option. <laughs> Some people go into marriage thinking, well, of course I'll be faithful. Of course I'll be faithful, uh, unless my partner cheats. How many movies have you seen? Really, how many movies have you seen where uh, you know, the, 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 the script shows that one partner, you know, they think their partner is cheating on them, so they figures, well, you know, that gives me, you know, I have the, if they did it, so I'm going to do it. You know? Some people think, you know, I'll be faithful. Well, unless I fall in love with somebody else. I, I, I like that. I like the line that some partners say to their partner after, you know, they've been in, in unfaithful or have had a, you know, an affair, a long time affair with someone else. And they say, it just happened. <laughs> no, it didn't. <laughs> Absolutely not. It didn't just happen. There isn't a hand that came out of the sky and smacked you. Nobody roped you and you know, brought you in. 
No, you, you, you worked your way out of your marriage relationship one little decision at a time and, and established a relationship with someone else one little decision at a time. This business of, well, it just happened. No, it didn't. Or I'll be faithful unless, well, there's a divorce. This attitude is the rotten seed that grows to spoil the rest. Fidelity isn't fidelity unless the no matter what factor is in there. Even if you change, I'll be faithful. Even if there's heartache, I'll be faithful. Even if you are not able to meet my needs, I'll be faithful. The thing I want and pray for the most is the ability and the strength to be faithful and to be faithful until the end. Paul says in Ephesians 5.32 that the similarity between the marriage relationship and the relationship between Christ and the church is a mystery, but, but a little bit of light on that mystery. Doesn't Christ continue to love us and be faithful to us even though we don't always live up to our end of the bargain? Even though we fall short of doing the things we say we are going to do. He continues to love us, continues to be faithful to us. I think we get to experience the, 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 the person of Christ in life in many ways through marriage. Through the attempt to exercise fidelity in marriage, we learn a little bit about what Christ has gone through in being faithful and loving us. Now, one thing we do know about these two relationships, you know, the marriage relationship and the relationship between Christ and the church, is that, uh, which isn't hidden in mystery, is the fact that the rewards assigned for each only go to those who are faithful to the end. So for marital fidelity to be produced, you have to have complete fidelity, lifetime fidelity, and then one more, growing fidelity. Growing fidelity. If you're not more faithful today than on the day you were married, your marriage isn't growing. It's easy to be faithful on your wedding day. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I mean, she's, uh, she's beautiful. She, he's handsome. Everybody's dressed up. It's all perfect. It's new. It's fresh. It's exciting. It's easy to be faithful. Wait till a couple of babies come along. Wait till 40 pounds comes along. That's another story after that. You see, the first two components are where you want to be, the ideal, the goal, you know, complete lifetime fidelity. Growing fidelity, however, is where most of us are at. The key is to recognize the small nooks and crannies of our lives that are still unfaithful, still not given over to our loved one. Growing fidelity is nurtured by trials and tribulations and tests that challenge our commitment to remain faithful no matter what. In Genesis 2.24, the Bible says that a man and woman are said to cleave or to be fastened to one another. The glue that holds you together is faithfulness and each time you grow in that faithfulness, the more secure the bond. Growing in complete fidelity with a view of remaining that way opens the door to a host of marvelous blessings, a few of which I'd like to share with you uh, in this uh, lesson. So the blessings of marital fidelity. If you have complete lifetime growing fidelity, here are some of the rewards of that. Peace of mind. Peace of mind. No matter how much money or power you have, no matter how blessed you are with health or success, if you don't have peace of mind, you can't enjoy any of your blessings. So marital fidelity is one of the chief factors that contributes to this state of mind. What great peace you have when you have no ugly secret between you and your spouse. What great peace exists 
in a home and family where everyone from the youngest child to the in-laws know that this man and this woman are, woman is, are completely devoted to one another. You like being around people who love each other. It's, it's fun, you know? You like being around people who like each other and who don't have any secrets. I mean, just try being in a, just try, have you ever visited friends that are you know, in the middle of an argument when you arrive? <laughs> How uncomfortable can that be? It's pleasant to be around those kind of people because they enjoy peace between themselves and that peace is palpable. You can feel it when you're with them and a couple that are, you know, that are con continually banging heads together or where there's an ugly secret or you, know, you can feel the tension. Marital fidelity produces a clear and easy conscience and that state of mind yields the wonderful spiritual fruit of peace. Another blessing of marital fidelity, mature love. Teenagers think they know about love because they see so much sex online on TV and movies and music. Young marrieds think they know about love because they have frenetic sex life. But the only way to know about love is to love somebody for a lifetime. Then you know about love. You know about its sexual excitement, but you also know about its sense of gratitude and you know about its sense of humor and fun and you know about its tenderness and its kindness, its generosity, its resiliency. Love someone for a lifetime and you'll learn about sacrifice and forgiveness and yearning Marital fidelity creates an environment of security and trust, which enables a person to be real and honest, transparent, vulnerable. And there's no true love, no maturing love without these things in a relationship. You know, I thought I loved my wife when I married her. I mean, I ached for her. But after 40 years, that love has matured into such a, a broad and beautiful life that envelops the two of us in a world that belongs exclusively to us and our family. Today, people want love before they'll commit to fidelity. That's why they fail. Love is born and nurtured within the boundaries of marital fidelity and it grows stronger only in proportion to the bonds that hold the couple within a faithful marriage. Many years ago on my birthday, Lise had to go to Canada. I think it was during the time that her folks were ill and I think that's the reason she went to Canada. Oh yeah, to care for her dad. He was still alive at that time. So I, you know, I, I, got, I sent her to the airport and it was going to be my birthday and we weren't going to be together on my birthday. And when I got home, uh, you know, I went about my business this and that, and then that night I got ready for bed. And when I went to the bedroom, got ready for bed, there was a, a card on my, on my pillow. And uh, uh, she had gotten this card and I want to show you what was written inside of the card and read it to you. The card said someday, when we have been together for a very long time, we'll turn out the lights and slow dance on the porch in our bathrobes. I'll write you love notes in large print and tape them to the fridge. You'll finish my stories and I'll borrow your glasses and we'll wonder where the time went. And each night we'll roll to the middle of our old bed into one another arms, where we'll kiss and touch and dream the secret dreams that only old lovers know. Only a faithful spouse can give and receive a card like this and it not be the height of hypocrisy. 
the third blessing of marital fidelity I want to share with you today, joy on earth. I believe God created marriage so we could taste the joys of heaven in advance here on earth. Let's face it, no other thing can make you feel so happy or so miserable than your marriage. It can be heaven on earth or it can be hell on earth. And the difference can usually be traced to fidelity and the degree of it that you have. Joy is that feeling of peaceful happiness that comes when you have what you want and you know that having it and enjoying it is the right thing to do before God and man. Ever notice the happiness that some older couples have? They may be past their childbearing and sexual intimacy years. They may be physically limited and yet there's a joy in their voices and their eyes when they look and when they speak to one another. We, we see that here in church all the time. Have you ever wondered why that is? I'll tell you, a lifetime of marital fidelity. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't mean perfect fidelity. Were you kind of getting a little nervous there? I was describing this high, noble idea of fidelity. And even as I was describing it, I'm thinking, man, alive. Even I didn't, have, <laughs> I haven't even gotten there yet. I wonder how they feel. Yeah, I don't mean perfect fidelity. I mean a lifetime of working at being faithful. Working at it. Sometimes I succeed and sometimes I don't. Sometimes I hit the high point and sometimes I don't. This effort brings the reward of a felt and expressed joy. I'm working at it. I'm improving it. You know, I often work with couples, well, in the past, who for whatever reasons have been through more than one marriage before finding and persevering with one partner in a long-term faithful marriage. And they usually have many regrets, but the one that stands out the most is the regret of not having had the opportunity to give one's entire life to just this one person. That's the regret that a lot of divorcees have when they enter into their second and third marriage. They wish, oh, why couldn't I have found Joe, you know, why couldn't I have found Joe when I was 20, you know, and just had Joe and I would, you know, I could have had my whole life with Joe. I could, we could have been together a whole lifetime. It's all, it's, it doesn't matter, just change the name. Why couldn't I have met Betty when I was younger? You know, I, 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 we could have just been together. We could have been just us for our whole life. We could have been just us. It's that regret that they have. Lifetime marital fidelity yields a shared joy that nothing can take away or diminish. Lifetime fidelity is a privilege and a joy. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a burden. And I tell those people who have tried again at marriage and want to succeed, put this marriage into God's hands, offer it to Him. Make this the time that you will have and will succeed at a lifetime of fidelity. God will accept it. God is the God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances. So if I had the chance to speak to everyone in the state, not just this class, about the subject of marriage, I'd leave them with the following thoughts. To the young, I would say, remain pure. Remain sexually pure because this pleases God and it remains your most precious gift to your future spouse. I'll tell you something else that I've learned in counseling people. 
Nobody ever regrets being a virgin on their wedding night. <laughs> Nobody is ever sorry. Nobody is ever sorry that they're a virgin on their wedding night. Oh, they may be a little embarrassed because this is something new and this is a wow, this is something they've looked forward to and they're not sure and so on and so forth, but they're never embarrassed, they're never ashamed of it. They're never sorry for it. They're happy to be able to give the most precious thing they have of themselves to their partner. So most of you here, you know, our parents, grandparents, continue to remind your children how important it is to be sexually pure. Number two, to the unmarried, to the unmarried for whatever reason, because you've never been married or you've been married, but now you're unmarried. I would say before you marry or marry again, make sure that your future spouse loves God and is absolutely dedicated to the principle of marital fidelity. I don't know, but I, I tell young people, hey, you know, oh yeah, yeah you're engaged, w wonderful. You know, what, what, it, what are you talking about when you talk, when you're, you know, when you're going back and forth in your conversation? What are you talking about? Well, we're talking about the wedding. There's so much, you know, the caterer, the flowers, you know, the honeymoon, oh dear, you know, we have to, so many things that we're talking about. And I say to them, have you talked about marital fidelity? What? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, did you ask him if he is absolutely committed to marital fidelity? Well, I, I assume, no, don't assume. Talk about it. What are we going to do to guarantee that we're going to be faithful to one another? What little safety things are we going to, what little safety latches are we going to put into our relationship? You know, Lisa and I, we have safety latches. If I saw a woman that was appealing to me during the daytime for whatever reason, I went to the stores, a new member in the church, what, I don't know, you know. And, and that woman somehow just, you know, she, she was appealing to me, I would tell Lise. I says, hey, I got something to tell you. Oh yeah, what? I said, you know, uh, Sister Jones over there? Yeah, yeah, I think she's hot. Oh, <laughs> okay, good, I'm glad you told me. Well, I just want to let you know, well, that's good. Let, you want to pray about that? Yeah, let's just pray about that. You know, when you shine the light on something like that, I mean, you kill it. It's, I mean, that, <laughs> the next day I saw Sister Jones, you know, whoop, nothing there. Why? Because the light of truth, you know, shone on that potential sin and exposed it. Didn't even give it a chance. Didn't even have a chance to go any further. It's always funny to see Lee say hi to Sister Jones. Oh, hi, Sister Jones. <laughs> What's that all about? <laughs> yeah, seek a godly mate. Figure out how you're going to, you know, be a godly couple. And to those who are married, whatever state your marriage is in, and no matter how long you've been married, no matter what's happened in your marriage, the first step in improving your relationship is by implementing and practicing the components of marital fidelity. Yeah, it's never too late to recommit to the idea of being faithful one to another. It's okay. Instead of saying, you know what, I, you know, I, I, I love you and you know, we've been married uh, nine years and I still, uh, I still love you. you know, that's good, that, that confession of love, we have to do that from time to time. Because the thing that men and women in marriage need the most is not money, although money is helpful, uh, it's reassurance. Men need to be reassured that they're okay, that they're important, that they're appreciated. They need to be reassured. That's just the male character. And women need to be reassured that they're the one and they're the only one. Because there, every day there are new Sister Jones popping up. There are new models coming out. <laughs> the styles change. She needs to be reassured 
that she is still the one, like that song says. And then finally, to everyone else, I would say that whether you are married, single, divorced, separated, widowed, or any state in between, Jesus Christ can help you to be at peace with God, at peace with your spouse, and at peace with yourself. Whatever marital state you're in, Jesus offers always to save your soul. Sometimes a marriage is lost and it can't be brought back, but Jesus promises that he can save your soul no matter what condition it's in. And many times peace comes to the partners in a marriage when they first make their own peace with God through faith in Christ. You can't find peace with your spouse if you're not at peace with God. You can't achieve that holistic, all embracing, empowering faithfulness to your spouse if you are not first faithful to the one who enables a weak and sinful man or woman to aspire to such a lofty physical, emotional, and spiritual goal as lifetime fidelity. That's a big thing, that's a hard thing. We need God to help us achieve that. The first step therefore in achieving marital fidelity with your spouse is to make or renew your commitment to spiritual fidelity to Jesus Christ, who is not only the Lord of the Sabbath, but he's also the Lord of what we refer to as marriage. When he becomes the Lord of our marriages, then we really have an opportunity to achieve lifetime fidelity. Okay, so a few thoughts on uh, the blessings of marital fidelity. Two more lessons to go in our series, we'll be done. Thank you for your attention.